This production is brought to you by the World History Encyclopedia and the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, but today... We are Sadly, Nick couldn't be here today. Hello viewers of the study of antiquity in the Middle Ages. You haven't seen me before on this channel, but I am Kelly, and I am here with an important message about Nick, the usual host of this channel. As you may have seen from his post on the community page a few weeks ago, Nick has been in hospital. This is due to an infection in his heart that caused him to become septic. The infection had abscessed his heart and had shredded his aortic and mitral valves. And after multiple open heart surgeries, pneumonia, aggressive treatment to the infection and severe pain, Nick is now intubated and on dialysis for his kidneys, fighting for his life. Hi, this is D.W. Draffen. You may recognize my voice as the narrator of many of Nick's videos. This whole channel, The Study of Antiquity in the Middle Ages, started with just this one guy, his collection of books, and an undying curiosity for the past. Now, 470 videos and 150,000 subscribers later, Nick made his dream come true, and it's many of our dreams as well. He gave us a home. He's interviewed the leading historians of the day and given them a forum to discuss their most interesting ideas. For all the above, thank you, Nick. Get well soon. Nick's passion is his YouTube channel and has been working so hard to continue growing his community. He has recently turned 30, bought a house with his wife Morgan, and they are expecting their second daughter. And so, World History Encyclopedia has set up a GoFundMe campaign to help Nick and his family through this incredibly difficult time. The hospital bill will likely be significant, and a discharge date is not even being discussed at this point. So they have no idea how long his hospital stay will ultimately be. All the while, Nick has no salary and is on unpaid sick leave. Every single cent raised from this fundraiser will go straight to him and his family to help him recover and return to what he loves doing, creating content for you guys. If you would like to donate and help Nick and his family, you can find the link to the GoFundMe campaign down below. Thank you so much for your donations of any size. Every little bit will help Nick and his family. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined once again by channel favorite, geneticist Razib Khan. Mr. Khan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure, Nick. For our audience today who may not be familiar with your work, will you tell us a little bit about yourself and where they can follow you to really dive into the subjects that we all love, especially when combining DNA with history? Yeah, um, so you kind of said it right there. Uh, I am a history buff and a history nerd, but I also happen to be a geneticist. So I synthesize those two interests in a lot of my uh, public writings, and most of them you can find right now at my Substack, rezeeb.substack.com. You can find all my offerings at rezeeb.com. I write for Unheard in various other places, and also I have a blog, genexp.com. But yeah, uh, I write a lot of things. I produce podcasts. Like, no, the, the YouTube is here, though. So, you know, stay here for the YouTube. In a previous episode on the Magyars, you heard a name describing a group of peoples pop up several times, and that is the Khazars. And so we're going to discuss what ancient and medieval DNA has told us about who the Khazars were and where they came from. And so, Mr. Khan, I'd like to ask, when you hear about the Khazars, based on your research, your expertise, and even your imagination, what really comes to your mind when you think about who they were? Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, are the, is the Jewish Turkish kingdom, Turkic kingdom of uh, Eastern Europe, right? Because that's what we know about the Khazars. Uh, so the Khazars are a um, Turkic confederacy. Uh, they dominated uh, the region between the Dnieper and the Volga for several centuries up until actually the rise of Kievan Rus, uh, which ended up crushing their confederacy. Uh, they battled the Arabs multiple times. Uh, they uh, allied with Byzantium uh, in the seventh, uh, well, actually, uh, let's say eighth, eighth to ninth centuries. And in fact, married um, several times into the Byzantine royal lineage uh, uh, in several different dynasties. And um, they were Turkic. Uh, they were physically quite distinct. 
Um, they were described by the Byzantines as you would describe Turks, you know, kind of like uh, flat featured, um, you know, swarthy skinned, dark haired. So they look Turkish, we know that, and we have some DNA from modern Turks and some ancient Turks. Um, what's associated with the Turks is often haplogroup Q, uh, which is um, common among many uh, Altaic Siberian peoples. Uh, but another thing associated with the Turks is R1A. That's often R1A Z93, uh, but there are other types of R1As. And these are from probably almost certainly from Indo-Europeans. And so why would an Indo-European be present in the, in the early Turkic lineage? Because Indo-Europeans were present in the Altai region as early as 3,000 or 5,000 years ago in the Afanasivo people. So Indo-Europeans and Turks kind of emerged together. Uh, eventually the Turks rose and pushed out the Indo-Europeans, the Scythians, the Sarmatians, uh, the Ossetians, the Alans, all these groups, the Iranian speaking peoples of Central Asia, like the Kresmians, the Vasaktians, but um, they didn't just exterminate them, they absorbed them. And so uh, the Khazars themselves were Turkic speaking. Uh, they had a Turkic identity, but they had within them uh, ancestry from Sarmatians, Scythians, Sogdians, all these other groups. I'm only bringing this up, well, I mean, not only, but I'm bringing this up because there is a connection between the Jews, supposedly Ashkenazi Jews and the Khazars. This is not really mostly supported genetically because there's very little evidence of say East Asian admixture in Ashkenazi Jews, but there's a little, there's a little. So this is what I will say. I believe that eventually genetics will validate the possibility that some few lineages of the Ashkenazim go back towards indigenous people absorbed in Eastern Europe, in what is today modern Russia, who probably descend from some Khazar Jews. Okay, I, I do think that that's probably true. It's a very small number, but it's not nobody. Okay, I, I think there are going to be a small number. The Khazars themselves were religiously diverse. Some of them remained shamanists, worshippers of Tengri. Uh, others were Muslim, and others were Orthodox Christian. And then, of course, some were Jewish. Um, what I've read is that there is a supposition that the royal house of the Khazars adopted Judaism, partly to distinguish themselves from their neighbors, uh, the Christians to the West, the Muslims to the South. And so it was a good, good way to kind of, you know, compromise and, and stay neutral. And we, still, we see this um, later in history with pagan Lithuania, where they were apparently pagan for a really long time because they didn't want to pick Orthodoxy or Catholicism. They wanted to kind of hold out. Uh, so they had negotiating positions. So the Khazars were doing this with Judaism, I think. And so they were one of the great Turkish confederacies, Turkic confederacies, right? And Kiev and Rus crushed them in a series of battles, and eventually they disappear from history. But um, the Khazars are just one chapter in a longer story. Uh, earlier stories, the Go-Turks, uh, the first Turkish empire, which comes like all the way from basically Romania to Mongolia. It prefigures the Mongol empire. And then later, the Mongols themselves were highly Turkified in the Golden Horde, uh, so the Russians were under the yoke of the Tatars, the Tatar yoke. So the, the victory of Kievan Rus was a um, temporary affair in a way, when you think of it historically, when it came to the steppe versus the settled, the farmers uh, versus the nomad. So the Khazars ultimately lost, lost their battle against the various peoples um, who they fought, because they fought the Arabs, they won, um, they allied with the Byzantines, and uh, they were dominant for two to three centuries, but then the Russians... Uh, under the Rurikids uh, crushed them, okay? So these are, uh, you know, led by Varangians, Scandinavians, uh, who assimilated into the Slavic population, but eventually they themselves were overwhelmed by the Mongols, who were led by many Kipchak Turks. So um, the Khazars are just part of, I think, a bigger story here. But an interesting part with the Judaism. Before ending this episode, I'd like to ask two follow-up questions, and that is, We've discussed what modern DNA studies has told us about the Khazars. And so now I'd like to ask, what were some of the traditional viewpoints as to who they were, especially in older historiography? You know, I think the older historiography kind of knew they were Turks, but really what they said was they were heathens. So the, Juda the Judaism of the Khazars actually kind of late, I think, as they became more and more intertwined with... Uh, you know, it's the quote, civilized world. Uh, so the key with the Khazars is they like the Huns and the Avars. They're an Eastern Asiatic people that are not Christian that come onto the edge of the civilized world on the backs of horses in, in you know, huts. They are, they are Gog and Magog 
uh, they are the sons of Japheth, come from the east, you know. So Christians tend to interpret them in a very, very biblical way. Arabs, Muslims actually had similar explanations for Turks to the point where there's a Turkic scholar in Baghdad in the ninth century who wrote a counter narrative of how the Turks were actually going to be the salvation of the human race and not like, you know, not like the heralds of the Antichrist, which is what the Arab Muslims were saying. And so in terms of the older historiography, um, they were viewed as alien, as like uncivilized, as almost subhuman, right? So um, this is this is the story of the steppe nomad and what what they've had to deal with in terms of their depiction by settled peoples. From blog post comments to threads on YouTube, anything dealing with the Khazars, you tend to notice a focus on Judaism. And so my main question is, we know that Judaism did play a role albeit according to what we've discussed so far, maybe not as big as a role as we would imagine. And so my question is, when it comes to Judaism, the Khazars, and today, could there be a form of ethnic nationalism at play when it comes to focusing on just the Judeo aspect of the Khazars? I mean, yeah. I mean, insofar as, you know, there's a whole group of anti-Semites who want to disconnect modern Jews from the ancient Hebrews by saying they're Khazar converts. That's obviously false. Uh, modern Jews are about like 40 to 50 percent Middle Eastern and Anse Ashkenazi Jews, 40 to 50 percent Middle Eastern ancestry, about like, you know, 30 to 40 percent Southwest European and then the rest is Northern European, like 10 to 20 percent, like, you know, somewhere in that range. Um, so they're not they're not Khazars. Like I said, they have like a little bit. Um, there's some evidence of some East Asian ancestry in some groups. And where does that come from? We don't necessarily know. I think it could be Khazars. As far as the Khazars themselves, there's a lot more about them than their Judaism. But, you know, we want to interpret it in a modern lens in a way that's relevant to us. And, you know, as as your as your viewers know, um, the step is kind of ignored. It's just not a compelling narrative for most people. It's a source of bar barbarism, scourge of God, uh, terror and destruction. I mean, that's not totally unfair, but it's not all it is. So this idea of a Jewish Turkic tribe in, um, you know, tents on the Volga, that's just much more exotic and relatable, I think. And to my subscribers, definitely check out the links in the video description below. It's going to take you to all of the awesome work Mr. Khan is doing to help people like me and you better understand the past that we all love. And it's no secret, we love studying ancient DNA. We love interacting with the, you know, the top experts on these subjects and his podcast and his articles really provide that. And as someone who is actually a member of his Substack, I really can't recommend it enough. And so if you can go over there, join that community, and really give him your full support.